Today we're going to be looking at a controversial question. Foreign aid, does it increase growth? I think the first thing which needs to be acknowledged is that we were much more optimistic about the role of foreign aid and growth in, say, the 1960s. Here is Paul Rosenstein Rodin. You can find out more about him, by the way, in another uh, video lecture in this series. He said, launching a country into self-sustaining growth is a little like getting an airplane off the ground. There's a critical ground speed which must be passed before the craft can become airborne. So he was talking about the theory of the big push, the idea that if we increase investment, let's say, enough, that a country would begin to launch itself on the path of development. That once we pushed, once that country reached ground speed, reached that critical speed, however, it would take off on its own. It would begin to fly. So the question is, when we gave foreign aid, did the countries begin to fly? On the whole, the answer is no. Some countries, it is true, did take off, but they were the ones who didn't receive a lot of foreign aid. The countries that received a lot of foreign aid simply did not take off. This, by the way, is a picture of the Spruce Goose, uh, Howard Hughes's famous plane, the world's largest plane at the time it was built. It had one flight. This was as far off the ground as it ever got, and it never flew again. So what happened? Well, we could talk about corruption. We could talk about the importance of institutions, incentives, and so forth. We do a lot of that in other video lectures. So I want to give a slightly different perspective in, in this lecture. And I want to compare the predictions of the big push with the predictions of the solo model. Now, if you didn't do the solo model in previous video lectures, uh, don't worry. You'll get the basic idea here. If you did do the solo model, you remember that the sort of natural rate of the capital stock is given when the investment is equal to depreciation. And that natural level of capital, that also will give you a natural level of sort of GDP per capita. Your GDP per capita, your steady state GDP per capita, which is given by your investment and your de depreciation, population growth, but also by the fundamental institutions of your society, the productivity, organization, and so forth. Okay, now in the big push model, foreign aid pushes you to the tipping point, to change the metaphor a little bit, and gets you on that self-sustaining path of growth. What happens with foreign aid in the solo model? Well, in the solo model, some foreign aid will increase your capital stock. You build some uh, bridges, some railroads, some roads, some factories, and so forth. That's great. That increased capital stock will get you in increased GDP per capita. However, if you haven't changed any of the fundamentals in the economy, if all you have done is increase the capital stock, then what happens is your depreciation will exceed your investment. In other words, the SOLA model predicts that without changing any of the fundamental factors, an increase in the capital stock above its sort of steady state level, it will begin to depreciate. The roads will begin to fall apart and they won't be repaired. The factories will begin to break down and there won't be enough savings to fix the factories. The bridges will start to fall apart and so forth. And in fact, in many cases, this is exactly what happened. Factories were built in Ghana, and they began to fell, fall apart, and no one replaced them. Roads started to crumble. Even the infrastructure, which was considerable, left over from the colonial period, start to, started to decline. Because of this, countries were pushed back towards their steady state level of capital, their steady state level of GDP. So from the solo model, we have that if you don't improve any of the fundamental factors, organization, technology, uh, investment, and so forth, that an increase in foreign aid is just going to create depreciation, going to put you back to your steady state. That's the basic story. I want to talk a little bit about some of the recent econometric literature on aid and growth. So the modern literature really begins with Boone, who using data from 96 countries over a period of about 20 years, found that aid didn't increase investment. 
That is, it, you couldn't even find, not even growth, you couldn't even find a connection between aid and the things which cause growth, such as investment. This led to a lot of debate, a lot of different papers coming forth, back and forth, yes and no. The debate seemed to be resolved by the Burnside and Dollar paper. This paper sort of split the difference in a way. It said, overall, aid does not work, but when aid is combined or interacted with good policy, it does work. So when a country begins to get its act together, when it has opens its borders, when it reduces corruption, Burnside and Dollar said, then is the time that aid works. This really made both sides of people, both sides of the debate happy, and it seemed to suggest a policy direction that we ought to tie aid to uh, making policy better. However, Easterling and Easterly, uh, Levine and Rudman uh, found that the Burnside and Dollar result was not robust. I want to say a little bit more about that. So here's the basic story. What this graph shows, let's start with the one on the left, is once you've controlled for all the other factors, what is the effect of aid interacted with policy? And in the original Burnside and Dollar paper, you had basically this story right here. You had a positive effect of aid after you controlled for other factors and when that aid was interacted with good policy. Okay. Now, even in the original Burnside and Dollar result, you can see that it's not a terribly strong result. It may be driven by some outliers, possibly. Uh, a lot of things, you know, uh, a lot of other things are explaining uh, growth rather than aid. The effect is not that large, and so forth. Even taking into account there wasn't a strong result to begin with, uh, Easterly and uh, uh, Levine and Rudman run it with a little bit longer data, okay, and over here you see the same basic regression, okay, same variables, and now you have actually a negative result, but it's not statistically significant. So the whole result goes away with just minor changes in assumptions. The most recent paper in this literature is by Clemens and co-authors. It's a very good paper. What they do is they basically rerun all of the regressions which have been run before, and by creating a consistent data set, by creating a consistent set of control variables, they try and pinpoint where the agreements are, where the disagreements are, and what are generating some of the differences. They also point out many of the reasons why it may be difficult to find an effect of aid on growth. So for example, consider timing. When would you expect aid to have an effect on growth? If you spend aid this period, will it cause the economy to grow right away in a year, in two years, in five years, uh, depending upon exactly what you're spending on. If you're building a road or a bridge, for example, it may take several years to even build the bridge or the road. And then you might not expect growth for even several years down the line after that. That's one reason why it's difficult. Another reason, which a lot of the literature has tried to deal with, is what about if you give aid to the countries which really most need it, well, those are the countries which are growing slowest, so you might get a correlation between aid and slow growth, even when aid, in fact, does increase growth. And there's been a lot of different attempts to try and overcome this reverse causality problem. So when uh, Clemens and co-author deal with these things as best as they can, what they do is they argue that there are modest effects of aid on growth. And just to illustrate how modest these are, I want to give you some quotes from their article and it's really quite um, illustrative uh, when you compare with you know, some of the more optimistic predictions from the 1960s. So what they say, for example, is it is clear that in many countries, even large aid inflows have been insufficient to spark growth over any time horizon. So if you're in a poverty trap, it's really, really hard to get out even with a lot of aid sometimes. Aid appears to have a nonlinear effect on growth. And there may be limits on the degree to which even large aid receipts can further increase growth in the typical recipient. So a little bit of aid may go a long way, but as you apply more and more aid, you get less of a growth effect. Far more of the variance in growth across countries is accounted for by the non-aid covariates, the non-aid variables or explanatory factors in these regressions than by the aid variable. So even when aid matters, 
it matters less than just about many than many other things. So I, I think that's an accurate consensus view of the literature on foreign aid and growth today.